our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for praying. Now I'm going to invite my family to come to lead us in the Advent reading for today. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water covers the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. We are the followers of the root of Jesse Isaiah spoke of. We are the ones who are now called to stand as a signal to the world to all of creation, that peace is the will of the one who created us. Peace is the knowledge of the Lord that we proclaim from sea to shining sea. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea, proclaiming, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near, and bear fruit worthy of repentance. We light these candles, the candle of joyful hope and the candle of proclaimed peace, in part to remind ourselves that we are a people rising toward God's promise. But we also light them as a sign to the world, an announcement that there are some who hold on to hope and there are some who work the ways of peace. We stand as a sign that Emmanuel is still our fervent prayer. Would you take your Bible, please? We're going to go to the Gospel of Luke today to see what God would have us learn, understand, and apply to our lives based on this accounting of the birth of Jesus Christ. The reading is on page 1576. shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I will bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby 
wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherds' story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. May God add a blessing to this reading of his word by his spirit. Today's message is going to um, be based in part on Go Tell It on the Mountain, because the field on which the shepherds were working that night was probably not a flat one, uh, more like a hillside, I would imagine, in that country. And um, history cannot tell us who first sang Go Tell It on the Mountain, because the original author and lyricist was an enslaved African-American. We know much more about the people responsible for bringing this song to the world. It was popularized by the original Fisk Jubilee singers. You say, I don't know that I've ever heard of the original Fisk Jubilee singers, let alone the knockoff. Um, but that's because the Jubilee singers started out in 1871 as a brave little band of young people led by George White and Ella Shepard. Many of them were former slaves, and their mission was to raise money for their struggling university on a singing tour through northern cities. They began by performing only traditional hymns and classical arrangements to show their musical training. Their performances received a moderate amount of attention, but as you can imagine, in 1871, the journey was not easy. Three days before Christmas that year, the tide turned. The choir had run out of funds when the most famous preacher of the day, Henry Ward Beecher, invited them to sing at his church. They began to sing the songs of their hearts, the spirituals that they had learned under slavery. The wealthy congregation responded with tears and with donations. Soon they went from struggling to successful to famous, eventually world famous, even appearing before Queen Victoria herself. The concerts were the first time most Americans were introduced to spirituals, including Go Tell It on the Mountain. A seasonal crowd favorite, showing that the good news was truly spread over the hills and everywhere. In Luke we see God using a set of shepherds as witnesses to the birth of his Son. Now, on the night that it happened, the only announcement of Jesus' birth was to that group of shepherds. No one in the village of Bethlehem noticed, you can be sure of that. What does it tell us in Luke? It tells us that the graveyard shift was suddenly interrupted. Now, 
Picture yourself at a, at a job that, that you've held, and, and maybe you never had to work the graveyard shift. Maybe you always had good daytime hours, and Monday to Friday, and so on and so on. But these guys were working the dregs of the schedule. And people didn't think much of shepherds in those days. I imagine the ones that had to work the midnight shift were probably at the very bottom of the pecking order among the shepherds. But suddenly, the angel of the Lord appears as a spokesman for God. Now, he's not named here, but in chapter 1 of Luke, twice we see Gabriel named and appearing to give fantastic news to a priest named Zechariah and to a little girl named Mary. And it says in uh, Luke chapter 2 verses 8 to 14 that the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. Now try to picture that if you will. These men are out here working. They probably have a few fires uh, so that they could maybe see predators before they got near the sheep. But by and large, they're out under the stars. They have no illumination. And suddenly, that darkness is profoundly broken by a radiant light. Now, in the Bible, that's a way of saying God is present in His glory when the light shines. Psalm 22.3 also tells us that God is present in the praises of his people. So we need to keep that in mind. So the messenger appears. What's the message? Well, I don't give you a lot of space if you're taking notes here, but there are um, three things. The first is that the message is universal. Good news that will bring great joy to all people. This is good news, great joy to all people. And these shepherds, as I said, were among the most marginalized people of that culture. So the fact that the angel appeared to them, and not to kings, not to mayors, not to rich folk, but to these shepherds, underscores this truth. The second thing the message is, it is Christ-centered. Christ-centered. The angel says he is the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord. Interestingly, this is the only place in Luke's Gospel where Jesus is called the Savior. So that's important. We take note of that. The word for Lord implies that the person is a Redeemer. So this message is Christ-centered, and the message about Christ is salvation comes through him. And third, it is fulfilling prophecy. The message is fulfilling prophecy. What did the angel say? Born today in the city of David, just as predicted in the Old Testament, God is keeping his word, God is keeping his promises, and the Messiah is born. Now, it didn't end there. There was more wonderment and, and excitement to follow because an angel chorus appeared. Now, with the joke, of course, is that, that the heavenly host is uh, not an MC, right? This is not... Pat Sajak or, or uh, Wink Martindale. Whoa, we're really going back now. No, not that kind of host. An army in ranks of soldiers, God's angels, the race that he created to bring messages to earth, but also to worship him. And that's what they're doing here. The host of angels celebrate this news by offering worship to God. And they affirm that the message is good news in uh, verse uh, let's see in verse 14 P 
peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. And this is similar to Luke 10, 21, where Jesus said that God chose to reveal his truth to those who had childlike faith. So we've looked at the appearance of the angels. Let's look now at the faithfulness of the shepherds who received this announcement, who had this exciting experience. What did they do? They faithfully attended to the newborn Messiah. They were faithful to go see for themselves. And I think God motivated Luke and directed Luke to say that very thing. Oh, they could have just stayed on the hillside and basked in that light and said, oh, isn't that wonderful news? Yippee. But no, they went to see for themselves. They wasted no time agreeing to go to Bethlehem in verse 15. And verse 16 tells us that they hurried, hurried to Bethlehem. In fact, they were in such a hurry, they left their flocks on the hillside. Yikes. What's the boss going to say when he comes around in the morning? But notice in verses 17 and 20 that they were faithful to witness to what they'd been told. They were faithful to witness to what they had seen. Verse 17 tells us they told everyone what the angel had said to them about this child. Imagine going up to total strangers. Hey, you won't believe what happened today. Knocking on doors. This is so exciting, I just have to tell you. They went to everyone and told them about the child. Then in verse 20, when all of it's over, they went back to their flocks. Notice it says back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had seen and heard. So they returned to work. They went back to their jobs. And i got to believe that God protected all of those sheep. And they just, you know, contrary to sheep behavior, stayed where they were put and returned to their lives, but they were forever changed by that experience. And it says in verse 20 that they had heard and seen that it was just as had been told to them. So once again, Luke is letting us know God keeps his promises. You can trust God. What he says he will do, he will do. Third and finally, let's look at the reactions that occur after this wonderful, blessed event. First, the residents of Bethlehem. Now, just imagine, you're probably not out at night a lot in Bethlehem. It's not a big place. Um, kind of, a, kind of a, just a little stopping point, a bump in the road. You don't go out at night a whole lot, but... All of a sudden, your little village is swamped by shepherds who are going around and shaking everybody's hand and, as I said, knocking on doors and making loud, joyous proclamations of what they have seen and heard and angels and all of this. And it says that those people were astonished. Well, I can understand that. Astonished maybe because these shepherds were acting so strange, but also astonished at what they said. Now that word astonished doesn't mean that they disbelieved or even doubted, only that they were surprised at what the shepherds had said. So the people of Bethlehem were pretty well surprised that evening. Mary on the other hand, in verse 19, kept it in her heart. Now, um, other versions besides our New Living uh, Translation will use the word ponder. Mary pondered these things in her heart. What's interesting about that word in the original language is that in chapter 14 of his gospel, Luke will use that same word 
but it's translated there as engaging in a battle. And in the book of Acts, which Luke also wrote, chapter 17, verse 18, it's a conversation, maybe even an argument, going back and forth between these people. So when we read this verse, we, verse 19, we kind of have a hallmark moment. We go, oh, Mary pondered in her heart. So sweet. And I don't think that's the whole story. I think Luke wants us to know that Mary struggled to understand all of these things. Now, she may have been a little frightened. We're not told of her emotional state, but she struggled, I think, to really understand all that this would mean. What we see here in Luke chapter 2 is that God used a set of shepherds to witness to the birth of his son. The announcement of the birth of his son in Bethlehem on the night it was uh, occurred in Bethlehem was the shepherds only. The angels had been out on the hillside. But in the, in the village, it was these shepherds. Now, verse 18, if we can go back there for just a second, is kind of a puzzle to me. We talked about how in this society, shepherds were disrespected. I mean, you know, keep an eye on that guy. He's a shepherd. He'll probably steal you blind. And yet, why would anybody in the village believe them enough to be astonished? How do we account for that? And I think I can account for it with a little story. I'm going to use this to conclude. It comes from a message entitled, Angels We Have Heard on High, by Dr. Justin Immel Sr., who told of prospectors who set out from Bannock, Montana, which at that time was the state capital or territorial capital, in search of gold. Now picture this, if you will, these, this set of men leaving the, their town and uh, heading out into the wilderness to look for gold. And of course, who did they meet there? The Native Americans, who were not very happy to see them and stole all their ponies and told them to just go back home. So they set back for Bannock. Some of them had died en route. It was just very discouraging. And as they went back, they stopped at a river to get a drink, and one of them looked into the water, saw a stone that caught his attention, took a hammer out of his prospecting kit, and tapped on it until the stone split. And he said, I think we've got gold here. And they set to panning in the river that very moment and discovered um, $12 worth of gold. Now you're going, whoopee, I got that in change in my couch cushions, uh, $12, who cares? But in that day, a sizable amount of money. In fact, it encouraged them to stay the next day and continue panning, and they realized $50 in gold. Returning to Bannock, they vowed together that they would not say a thing to anyone in town about this gold strike, this claim that they were going to make. But they were to secretly re-equip, get new horses, get new equipment, and go out in a day or two. And so they did that. One morning they got up and 300 men followed them out of Bannock. And they turned on each other. Who told? Did you tell? I didn't tell. Did you tell? Nobody told. But what gave them away was the joy on their faces. That's it. They had a spring in their step. They had uh, a glow in their countenance because they had found what they were looking for. And so I think what explains verse 18 is that these shepherds had the same glow, the same smile. 
the same infectious joy. And people picked up on it and said, well, I don't get it, but it must be true. Now, how much more should we have that on our countenance, in our words, in our deeds, not just during this Advent season, but all the year round? People can see the joy of following Jesus Christ. And in the minute, they might say, I don't get it, but I want it. And that's our opportunity to worship to him. Kent R. R. Kent Hughes said this, The truth is, even if Christ were born into the world a thousand times, you would still be lost. The Christ who was born into the world must be born into your heart. Religious sentiment, even at Christmas time, without living the living Christ, is a yellow brick road to darkness. We want to be on the road of joy. And that road leads us to Jesus Christ. We're going to take some time now to observe the Lord's Supper. We're going to celebrate the truth that was confirmed to these shepherds. We're going to renew our relationship with Christ as we come together at his table. Will you take your bulletin or your songbook, please? And as our preparation for communion, we will sing, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. 591.
That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. I'd like you to just spend a few moments with me in the privacy of your own heart. You need to bow your head or close your eyes. Stand before the Lord. And this table is for you. Regardless of where you might hold a membership, what counts here is that you belong to Jesus. Heavenly Father, let all who have received you, who have gained eternal life, know they are welcome at this table. Let those who have not yet taken that step of faith refrain or take it first and then participate as a brother or sister in Christ. This is your table. It is our joy. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We're going to ask you to serve yourselves this morning. We have available the elements in a package. We have them separately. You may choose either one. We're going to ask, starting in the back row, that you would come to the center aisle and come forward, return to your seat by means of the outer aisles, and hold your bread and cup until we uh, are all served. And if you prefer to be served where you are, we have someone in the back who will bring the bread and cup to you. So just slip your hand up. Come, feast at Christ's table.
Are there any awaiting service? And I would ask you to take the bread, the bread being the symbol of the living human body of Jesus Christ, who suffered in our place, who died in our place, and thankfully raised in our place as well. In his memory, eat you all. Now take the cup, which Jesus himself said is the new covenant, the new agreement between God and his people provided for by his blood. As we await his coming again, drink you all. Take your bulletin or your songbook, please. <clears throat> and now we're going to sing the hymn, Christmas Carol, Go Tell It on the Mountain. I want to invite you to stand as we sing. Climb that mountain. And let's sing out. enjoy some time together and some delicious pie. Alright? Keep all that straight. You don't have to do it in exactly that order, so no test. 
May you go forth with that joy in your heart. May it shine forth in your face. May it be heard in your voice and in every deed you do. Amen. Thank you.